What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Interviews YouTube channel for a conversation I'm very excited about because I think making any movie at any stage of your career is kind of a minor miracle. But in particular, someone making their feature directorial debut is a huge, huge deal that needs maximum celebration. And that's what's happening for Arkasha Stevenson on an Omen movie. Nonetheless, the director of the first Omen. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. So I wanted to kick off our conversation just with some some broader questions so that our viewership can get to know you and also so we can cover some of your past titles that I love, love, love. So first, a couple of horror specific questions for you, and I'll start with the basic one, but it still feels like important information to know to me. What is the very first horror movie you saw that scared you? Um, honestly, I mean, it's so funny because I was just talking to my mom who came into town about this. And I said, what movie really scared me as a child? And in my head, it was, you know, The Shining, The Exorcist. And she goes, it was Braveheart. Braveheart scared the bejesus out of you. <laughs> and I remember this because I remember um, I went to the theaters with my mom thinking it was a Care Bear movie and getting something totally oh my God. <laughs> I think it was just like also the fact that it's it's present it's a historical story and you're seeing all this violence and as a kid you just don't know that people do this stuff to each other yet you know so um yeah thanks. the thought the thought that Braveheart could be a Care Bear movie is kind of blowing my mind right now. <laughs> I'm absolutely tickled by that idea right now. And now, I i mean, I feel like this is something that I could speak into existence, a Care Bear horror movie. Hey, man, I'm all over it. <laughs> like, call me. All right. So that, that was the first movie that, that scared you. But now I kind of want to take it a step further. What's the very first horror movie you remember watching that made you appreciate the power of genre storytelling, where it left you wanting to make that kind of film yourself? Yeah. Well, okay. There, there's kind of two two answers to that. One is um, on A and E on Valentine's Day, growing up, there was always a double feature of The Shining and The Exorcist, of course. Um, and so that was the first. Those were the first horror movies I really remember watching and falling in love with. And but I was watching it not through the lens of horror. I was just watching because I was so young. You know, I just thought I was like spying on people through the television. And it's like, oh, this is just life, you know? Um, so those, but I think that was, those are the ones that in my heart, I feel the most nostalgia for. Um, and then the first movie that I watched where I said, that's what I want to do wasn't a horror movie, actually. It was a David Lynch film and it was Wild at Heart. And, um, and at the time I was studying to be a photojournalist and his films, I thought, you know, everybody says, oh, David Lynch is a surrealist. Well, and I was like, well, he didn't strike me as a surrealist because he, he just seems like a humanist, like somebody who is really just going to the fringes of realism and finding these very unique ways to talk about human emotion and human behavior um, that maybe isn't, isn't mainstream. Um, that, that really spoke to me and rocked my heart. I want to follow up on the photojournalism part of things. I'm assuming you studied that a little bit. So is there anything about studying that kind of, you know, visual medium that you found coming in handy with your directing work? Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm a very shy person. Um, I, and it, photojournalism was the perfect way to engage with people for my personality. And it's such a way, it's such a unique way to explore the world. Um, there's so much, I don't know. It, it, there's a lot that you don't realize is going on around you. And I think photojournalism really makes you pay attention to that. Um, but then it's, it also, I think, put me in a lot of situations that, um, that made me uncomfortable and made me learn how to, to talk to people and, um, to also understand, um, realism. I know that sounds really intuitive, but you, you're studying reality when you're a photojournalist and you're studying people. And, um, and so that, I mean, I don't think I would be a filmmaker if I wasn't a photojournalist before, you know, hmm. Uh, you could, I mean, I think you could see some of that, that kind of sensibility coming through in your, in your work in this movie, because I feel like, um, 
the scares are only as effective as close as you feel to the characters. And there's a lot of very stunning imagery in your movie, but there's also a lot of imagery that definitely enhances that connection between viewer and character. So yeah. I have to imagine it comes from that background. Well, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. So you decide you want to be a filmmaker. Here's a, a big old two-part question for you. When you first decided you wanted to direct, what did you think was the first step to making that dream a reality? And now having done it, would you recommend that first step to another aspiring filmmaker or did you find something more effective along the way? No, well, it, it's going to make me sound really reckless and irresponsible and a little bit dumb. So, you know, buckle up. But I, so I saw Wild at Heart and I realized, I said that that is what I want to do. I'm going to do that. So I looked up David Lynch. I saw that he went to AFI film school and I was like, okay, I'll go to AFI film school. And I went into the interview and, you know, AFI, they um, accept you based on discipline. And I just checked director, but I didn't know what that meant. And, <laughs> and so in the interview, they're like, why do you want to be a director? And I was like, I don't know. I'm here because of David Lynch. And, <laughs> And um, they were very kind. It did not kick me out and accepted me into the program. Um, and as much as an idiot as I sound in that story, I also do recommend just going with your gut and diving in and just following what you like and what speaks to you. Um, Cause that it's a really fun adventure. <laughs> I feel like that's the only mentality one can have in a business like this too. You kind of just got to like keep jumping in feet first, like time and time again at every single stage of your career. Oh yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, you know, it's hard to be faint of heart, I think in, in this business. And so it's, you got to dive in. Oh, without a doubt. I'll ask one follow-up question about a uh, film school. I love asking this question. Surprise, surprise. It's another, another two-parter. Mm -hmm. What is something you learned in that program that you still find yourself using today? But then also, what is something that all the schooling in the world never would have prepared you for when you hit your first professional set? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I think that I'm so grateful for going to film school because I think it really taught me how to collaborate I think, you know, coming from the world of photojournalism, you're very much a lone wolf and you're, you're doing everything yourself. And, um, and sometimes you, you won't ever work with another person. Um, and so then all of a sudden you're a director and you're working with all these different department heads and you're collaborating with, you know, sometimes hundreds of people. And, um, and I think what it was so nice getting to learn about the other disciplines and learning how to speak creatively with other people, um, which sometimes I think is harder than, than I intuited, um, but also not as hard as I thought it would be at the same time. Um, but also, you know, I think it's, you can get all those skills, but if you don't have something to say, they won't help you at all. So I think like also a lot of film school was understanding like, Oh, what, what do I want to contribute to this like bigger con conversation? And that's not an answer you come up with right away. You know, it's still, I'm still trying to figure it out, but, but knowing that there is something that you want to speak to somewhere was, um, was I think important. I love hearing answers where I can take what you just said and be like, like, yeah, I saw that in your movie. You did that. That's really nice. Thank you. <laughs> so before before I get to uh, First Omen, I have to touch on two past titles, one of which is is one of my favorite shows like of all time, by far. I'm obsessed with Channel Zero. I think it was the most brilliant show in the world. I am desperate for it to come back. So I guess I guess my my question for you on that one is when when you got that opportunity, did you feel prepared to jump into directing a whole season of that show? Because like you hadn't directed a feature yet, and that's essentially like directing math. Um, three features. Yeah, it was intense. I'm also thank you for being a Channel Zero fan. I am obsessed with Channel Zero myself. I know I'm biased, but I just think it's a fantastic show, and it's like. Our, our era's Twilight Zone. And I, you know, I just, it's so true. I really want Nick to keep making that. that. Um, but it's, um, it was, it was a little bit of a jump. 
that's a little bit of a leap, you know. I Nick, the showrunner and creator, had seen a short that me and my creative partner Tim Smith had done called Pineapple, and this short is it's like twenty minutes, um, but people were just calling because it's a little longer than a short film. People are calling it a pilot. And so I think everybody had thought that I had shot television before. And I was just like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trust me with your season of television. <laughs> so, sometimes it's just about like giving off that confidence, not necessarily having the confidence and authority, but just exuding it. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can. Doctor, do you concur? Yes, I concur. <laughs> um, now all I want to see is the Catch Me If You Can, like a version of Catch Me If You Can, but with a film or television director. <laughs> that's actually an amazing movie. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a great idea. Yeah, but it, it was wild. But also, you know, the approach is the same, I feel like, which is actually really refreshing. It's like just focusing on your character in the world and going step by step and not having a panic attack and you're good. <laughs> but it was, I mean, also I, I joke, but, but Nick was, Nick is a fearless creator. And I think he just put so much trust in Tim and I off the bat and was so insanely supportive that I think it was a really unique experience that um, I feel really lucky to have. Like it, that, it's rare to find somebody like Nick. You know, he is something else. That, I, like, what do we need to do to bring that show back? It just seems like such a no brainer to me. I know. I don't know. Like, whose whose house do we have to, you know, get and have a giant party in front of? And yeah, really. <laughs> Um, I'll go from one uh, project that Nick is associated with to another because you also directed an episode of Brand New Cherry Flavor, which I thought was phenomenal. And actually, now that I'm saying it, yet another show that I think deserved more. But I am very curious about your experience directing a pilot episode on that one because you had also directed other things like, a, I believe, an episode of Legion. But when you're directing a pilot, you get this opportunity to, to really set the tone for the directors that follow. So what was it like? like tackling that experience on that show? It was really exciting because it's like, we, that's when you really get to start understanding and creating the rules of the world and kind of the parameters of the world. And that I think was, you know, something that we got to do in Channel Zero, but with Channel Zero, we were working within this this universe that, that the crew and the creators were all very reverent to. And this was like starting from um, visually getting to start from scratch and create your own language. Sorry, there's a fly that's in love. Sorry. And there's an old school collider video where we're on set and there's a fly flying around my face and I just like snatched it and I grabbed it. It was in my hand. It's like really like a, a clip I cherish forever. <laughs> Thurman and Kill Bill, that's great. Um, yeah, but it's, it was um, getting to do Brainy Cherry Flavor, I think prepared me for doing this movie and starting to understand the world that you're in and how your character fits into it visually was a really great exercise. And then anytime um, I can make somebody vomit a kitten over and over again, I will gladly do, you know, it was one of the highlights of my life. So <laughs> I think that's a totally reasonable rule of thumb to follow right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so getting into First Omen now, I, I guess like the first big burning question that I have is how exactly does one not only get their first feature opportunity, but get their first feature opportunity on a franchise like The Omen with a studio like 20th Century at your back? Man, I don't know. It was, a, it, yeah, I thought I was getting punked when our agent called and said like, yeah, it's you, you're directing it. And we were like, What? <laughs> Um, it was really a really pleasant, dreamy experience. I know that sounds really Mr. Rogersy, but but it was actually um, very smooth and almost felt spoken, you know, spoken in in a weird way. Because I um, I just met Gracie Whelan, who works at Phantom Four, and she was really kind and sent me the script and let me read it and. I was already such a big Omen fan and so was Tim and, um, and it had a very special place in our hearts. So I think we really approached the script as skeptics and Omen lovers. And then we opened it and the lead character is this novitiate 
Um, and we were just really, I think, surprised that the lead would be a young woman. And that felt like a really great um, re-entrance into the franchise. And then it's really all about answering the question of, of how did Damien come into be? And to talk about that, we're going to be talking about birth themes. You know, we're going to be talking about female body and and uh, and autonomy over the female body. And that's that's I'm very that's something that I was really wanting to speak about. And also, you know, doing that through body horror set pieces, I really love to explore body horror. And so that was the pitch that we we went forward with. And I think one of the scenes that we really pitched was the birthing clinic scene. Um, and we talked about what we wanted to shoot and how we wanted to shoot it and expecting Disney to laugh and shut their laptop. And, you know, we were with our producer, Keith Levine and, and David Goyer, and they were so supportive that I was like, yeah, I'm just going to pitch this. And, um, and it, everybody was in, it was very cool. The joy it brings me that these movies are now technically Disney movies. <laughs> it makes my heart, my horror loving heart so full. Isn't it nice? Disney has a vagina now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, that's, that's definitely the quote that's going to burrow its way into my brain from this interview now. Um, a couple of follow-up questions I have. Um, I'll go to David and, and Keith first as producers. You kind of just touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious also when you bring it into the uh, the film the filming process as well, what is something about how the two of them operate as producers that, you know, helped you exceed your own expectations for your work on the film and also protect the vision you had? Yeah, I think, you know, what was really special about these guys is is just the inherent trust that they put in us. I think that there's like no bigger gift in this industry than trust for an artist. Like that's gold. And um, they were the, like these wonderful protectors of the film that really helped push it through, which is really interesting because this is like a very female centric film. You know, we have a huge female cast. It's talking about very specific female issues and these guys um, were just there every step of the way, pushing it forward, um, which I, yeah, I'm not going to get emotional, but it, it's, it's a really empowering feeling, you know. It's like one of my favorite things to hear about is, you know, folks who have been in this business for a while, empowering newer voices. And then, you know, as you continue on and you pay it forward, and that's kind of how we, we all lift each other up. and. Always makes me happy to hear things like that. Yeah, it's really, it's a very cool feeling to have these, you know, to have people believe in you and and really help you move forward. So that was my producer follow-up. Oh, the script. Um, I always love hearing about how a script can evolve along the way. So what would you say is the biggest difference between the first draft you worked on and what everyone will now see in the finished film? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that... What was so great about this script when we read it was the the structure and the following Margaret and um, how it dovetails into the 1976 version. And um, that's really what excited us about the project and that it was giving so much real estate for character, a, new, a brand new character up front. Um, and so I think a lot of what Tim, Tim and I tried to do was really personalize the horror and really bring it into the body and um, bring out these themes of, of, um, of birth and what happens to women's relationships with each other, but also what happens to the female form physically when you're in this very oppressive, you know, male dominated, dominated institution. And also trying to connect that to um, a lot of the, the political turmoil that was happening at the time in Italy in the 1970s, because I think that while the script gave us a real anchor at the end for how Damien was born, we really wanted to try and answer a little bit more of why. And, um, and I think that that's something that's so special about the films that came out of the 70s was that they were, they were very focused at talking about what the cultural anxieties were and what was happening to the, the 
family unit and the human psyche during, you know, the counterculture and, and the effects of Vietnam War and people just mistrusting institutions. And I think that there is a huge um, parallel between the 70s and right now. A good combination right there. I'm going to get into uh, some spoilers soon. I want to squeeze in two more questions before we do that, though. First, I, like this is an enormous question, kind of asking for the secret sauce a little bit. But I know a lot of people are always apprehensive when they hear about, you know, their iconic uh, horror franchises getting new installments. So having gone through that experience yourself and now come out the other side, what would you say is one do and one do not for adding a new installment to a beloved horror film franchise? Yeah. Well, I think one don't is um, don't try and replicate what the masters have done. I mean, Richard Donner is such, yeah, he's a master. This is a perfect film. He made a perfect film. And I, not only did I not want to, but I couldn't replicate that if I tried. I'm just not, <laughs> my skills are not there. Um, and so I think one antidote to that, which I would say is the do is trying to personalize and bringing yourself to the project. Because I think that, that the more specific you are, the more it'll speak to people. At least that's my hope just because that's what we tried to do with, with this was to try and, and say like, okay, well, what, what do we want to say in response to what the omen was saying? Um, and, and bringing it a little bit more, yeah, making it more personal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I I very much appreciate that combo right there. All right. One more question before I do spoilers. Just just for I love how this is going to make me sound so greedy right now. You just release a, a, a new horror movie and I'm like, give me more. But let's say you got the opportunity to add a new installment to another popular horror franchise that you love. What franchise would you choose and why? Yeah. You know what? There's um, I don't know if it's another franchise, but one of the influences for us on this film was the Carl Dreyer film Vampire from 1932 and the way it plays with um, perspective and the supernatural. And I am obsessed with this film. I don't know. You might watch this film and then watch our film and be like, what are you talking about? And um, <laughs> I promise it's in there. Um, but that that's a film that I would really love to try and contemporarize and and revitalize it, it's dangerous because I, I also think that that's a perfect film um you know made at the perfect time so um we're, we're talking about dangerous territory here but but I, i'm obsessed with that film <laughs> I feel like all the movies out there that I'm so precious about and I'm like, don't touch them again. Don't ever try to make remake them. But then by doing that, I feel like sometimes you're you're minimizing the reach it could have and you never know who will only see it in a newer version and then maybe be inspired to go back and watch the original. So I feel like the older I get, the more open minded I get about expanding my favorite film franchises. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's a, it's I think it's good to be skeptical about about approaching them again. Um, but it's also, I don't know, it's always so fun to revisit those worlds. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right. With that, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody who has not seen The First Omen. The rest of this interview is not for you, but good thing. You can go and you can catch it in theaters and then you could come back and watch the spoiler portion of this interview. 